joining, no? Sir, I, I, he said, yes, sir. I'll just call him, sir, again, yeah. I just remind him, it's okay. All right, we're about to start. Yes, sir, yes, sir. Uh, good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this uh, Mac recording Monday in Musics. progress. And uh, uh, unfortunately, last time we had this session on bad arrhythmia, somehow I think it went into complete block and uh, cardiac arrest. You know, now we are back in sinus rhythm, and uh, Dr. Mukund has kindly agreed to uh, present this uh, session, and uh, I am thankful to him. And Dr. Padmanabh Kamat is supposed to join, probably is busy, but we'll start off the session. So it is over to you, Dr. Mukun. Thank you, sir. First of all, I uh, would like to thank for the opportunity for repeating this talk. Uh, this is a small focused talk. I'm not sure I'll be using the entire one hour, but I will try to go as explanatory as possible for the PGs. Right now, I'll stop my video for improving the quality. And yeah. So this talk, uh, the scope will be first defining variety arrhythmia, then classification, the ECG approach. All this I will cover in three or four slides. The rest of the talk will be full of examples. And finally, I will show some ECGs where uh, there is something beyond variety arrhythmia. So by definition, heart rate less than 60 per minute in adults is called variety arrhythmia or bradycardia. Different rate cutoffs for newborns and young children exist. So we should be aware of what we are talking about when we mean bradycardia. It is an awake adult versus a sleeping adult or a uh, kid, newborn. Each fraction has a different heart rate definition uh, for bradyarrhythmia cutoff. And once we have a bradycardia, we should know that it can be due to disorders of impulse generation at the level of sinus node or due to the subsequent impulse conduction at the level of AV node or any other level, so atrial, uh, this Purkinje system or even the ventricle. So our diagnosis should be complete, right? From starting from the AV node, what happens at the level of AV node, what is there in the atria, how the AV node behaves beyond AV node, the bundle branches. Then the normal sinus rhythm implies that impulse generation is normal at the rate of 60 to 100, 
subsequent AV conduction is normal with a normal PR interval, and QRS morphology doesn't suggest a bundle branch block, hemifacicular or total bundle branch block. Then only we call normal sinus rhythm or NSR. It's implied uh, when you use the term NSR, all these levels of conduction. So at the level of sinus node, we may have sinus bradycardia, then we may have sinus node exit block, either first degree, second degree, or third degree. Because we don't have an ECG equivalent for SA node firing, uh, only we have is P wave, which is, happens after the SA node has fired, and we don't have a SA node recording equivalent in a surface ECG. So unfortunately, we cannot diagnose first degree or third degree SA exit blocks. What is possible is to diagnose a second degree SA exit block, which we'll see uh, in the subsequent talk. At the atrial level, there are hardly any bradyarrhythmias because atrium is not usually involved in impulse generation. And generally, it always conducts, either in organized form or a disorganized form as AF. Rarely, we may have atrial standstill, which means that whatever uh, impulse or uh, output you use to pace the atria, it fails to capture. There's no excitability at the atrial level. This is a very important diagnosis because it carries manifold risk of stroke than the usual atrial fibrillation. And a high index of suspicion is necessary for making a diagnosis of atrial standstill. At the AV node level, we are very much familiar, the three degrees of AV block, first degree, second degree, and third degree. The first degree AV block, actually, nothing is blocked. It may be a misnomer, only then it's a small delay in conduction through the AV node. Then we should be familiar with definitions of escape beat and escape rhythms. Escape beat is a non-sinus beat that follow a pause. Anything that follows a pause is an escape beat. If it comes before the expected beat, then it's called ectopic. So we have to differentiate between ectopic beats and escape beats. So escape beats are preceded by a fall, uh, pause, whereas ectopic beats usually are followed by a pause. Now how to approach the ECG when you have a bradycardia? ECG approach is always beat by beat. We have to look for every beat in every lead because things may change as the strip advances. It may not be the same diagnosis throughout the diagnosis. Then we have to focus on the P wave because we don't have an equivalent of sinus node firing as mentioned. So we have to focus intensely on P wave and define the P to QRS relation, which is the cornerstone of defining AV conduction. If there are no P waves, we have to look for escape beats or fibrillatory waves. One of them should be there. Then define the rhythm as together, like right from the sinus node through the atrium, AV node, bundle branches into the ventricle. The same approach you have to follow. And all this should... Uh, should be included in our final diagnosis. If there is an AV block, we have to attempt to localize the level of block, either the proximal that is above the His bundle or a distal below the His. In EP lab, we talk about supraisin, intraisin, and infraisin, but in the surface ECG, it's uh, enough that we attempt to do it proximal versus distal conduction system. And always look for clues towards underlying diagnosis. Why the bradyarrhythmia happens? Is there a hyperkalemia? Is it a hypothyroidism? Is it a hypothermia? Is it intracranial bleed or a you know, congenital heart disease like corrected transposition that's contributing to the bradyarrhythmia? So ECG may give clues for these as well. So apart from defining the rhythm disorder, we have to uh, train our eyes to look for why this happened, the root cause of this rhythm disorder. Now we'll go into the ECGs. Before that, we'll borrow a Mark Twain quote. A person who won't read has no advantage over who cannot read. So. It's not enough that we know how to read an ECG. We have to use it meticulously. And it's very important in bradyarrhythmia. This is the first example, starting from the sinus node. It's a sinus bradycardia. In this ECG, we can see that P wave axis is compatible with sinus P wave, positive in 2, positive in 1, negative in AVR. And the heart rate is less than 60, maybe around 50 or 45. And so it's sinus bradycardia. But the PR interval is normal. Subsequent QRS conduction is normal without any bundle branch or fascicular blocks. And there is a morphological diagnosis of LVH followed by a strain. So it's a straightforward case of sinus bradycardia with LVH and deep T wave inversions. And mild clue here is that the T wave is overshooting the baseline. The inverted T wave towards the end, it's going above the baseline. This suggests that this is a myocardial hypertrophy rather than an ischemia. In true ischemia, classically, the entire T wave will be below the baseline. Whereas hypertrophy causing deep T wave inversions you may get a terminal overshoot of the T wave, like in this ECG. So that's a subtle clue that we are dealing with a LVH and not an ischemia. So otherwise, this is a sinus bradycardia. Uh, we don't know what's the cause. We have to look for all possible causes. And here is another ECG. Again, sinus bradycardia. And junction has escaped this time. 
there is hardly one P wave seen in this V1 lead, and the PR is not physiological. What has happened was sinus rate is too slow; that is slower than the junctional rhythm, junctional rate. So junctional rate is dominating. The fastest rate dominates in the ECG, so the junction is dominating. At times when sinus fires or atrium fires, if there is a AV, uh, AV node is not refractory, it will try to capture. Like in this third beat, my arrow sitting here in the rhythm strip, the third beat probably has captured the atrium or junction has captured, and subsequently the P wave is PR interval is too short. So it's just facetious relationship. They are just seated together. They are not related to each other because in normal hearts, such short PR interval is not possible. It's not physiological. So here, sinus node for some reason is not firing, and junction has taken over. Now, if this patient comes with us without any symptoms, so what will uh, we do? I'll show you the rest of the history of this patient. We made him do exercise test. For that, we did a standing ECG. The moment he stood up, P waves appeared. Now we know that it's not sinus rhythm, of course, but heart rate is faster. So heart rate is heart is capable of some chronotropic response in response to hemodynamic or postural change. And subsequently, this is a pre-exercise ECG. It's very clearly sinus. The PO axis has uh, given a clue that it's a sinus P wave. And with ongoing exercise, the sinus has taken over. Excuse me, sir. Sir, Dr. Gaurav here, sir. Excuse me, sir. Sir, one doubt, sir, last ECG. Yeah, please, sir. Uh, sir, last ECG is that sinus rhythm ECG, sir. This one? This one? Uh, no, no. Previous, 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 previous ECG. This one? Uh, yes, sir. Yes, yes. Sir, yeah. uh, yes, sir, yes, sir. Sir, uh, it can be CHB also, no, sir? Can be because yeah. PR is varying. Yeah, that is a very good question. Uh, I'll just briefly explain this, but I'll explain it more along with CHB. For CHB, we have to uh, demonstrate AB dissociation. So atrium should be controlled by a different focus, and ventricle should be contained by uh, controlled by another focus. And more importantly, most importantly, atrial rate should be higher than the ventricular rate. So if atrium has itself has slowed down, the sinus itself is so slow that junction has escaped means we are not sure whether it's the CHB or not. It may be CHB, may not be, but what we are sure is there is sinus bradycardia with the junctional escape. We are not very sure that AV conduction is not possible in this patient with this ECG. But we are sure that sinus has slowed down, sinus bradycardia, the rate is slower than the junction, hence junction has escaped. To call it CHB conclusively, we should also document AV dissociation that P wave, which are capable of con getting conducted. Here, there is no P wave that is getting capable of getting conducted, that is falling outside the T wave or uh, after the STT complex. The ventricles are available for contraction, depolarized, or repolarized, but still the P wave is blocked. There's no such blocked P wave with this tracing. Hence, we cannot say that it's a CHB, but what it may or may not be, uh, subsequent evaluation only will point to, towards it, but it's sure that it's a junctional escape. Hope I'm clear with this. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. I'll explain that further in the, the section of CHP. So now we have a patient asymptomatic, no sinus rhythm at all, and sinus not well waking up with exercise or posture. So this is a very common situation, especially in young adolescents, aesthetically trained adults, or even children, where the vagal tone, vagal tone is so high, the sinus rate physiologically slows down, and the junction may escape. They may even show morbid type 1 or winky back block especially in halter, even during awake states. And easy thing to do are make him exercise, walk, or even cough. Any vagolytic manner will bring out the sinus rhythm. And then you can assess the sinus node function as well as AV node function before um, regarding it as a pathological disease. Usually this is benign. It can also happen in raised ICT scenarios. Mokan, Dr. Mokan. Sir? Sorry, sorry to interrupt. Is there, yeah. Are you in the CCU or something? Some... Beep, uh, yeah. beep is going on. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Just okay. Try. Okay. All right. Sorry. Okay. All right. Next one is a, a bit confusing one, just because it's not very common. Uh, hardly we'll see this, but more I think more often we miss it rather than not see it. This is the SA node exit block. As we discussed, there's no way we can find out first degree versus third degree SA block. Because in first degree AV block, imagine if there were a S wave, SA node equivalent. So SP interval, S to P wave interval would have prolonged. And heart rate would have slowed or would not have slowed. We don't know. So because we don't have such a wave in the ECG, we will never diagnose a morbid, uh, sorry, first degree SA exit block. Then comes the SA Venky back or morbid type 1 AV block. 
in this it's uh, easy to understand if you are aware of Wenckebach phenomenon at the level of AV node. In Wenckebach at AV node level, the PP remains constant, the PR progressively prolongs, whereas RR interval shortens. Similarly, if you imagine SA exit block, the SASP interval, which of course is not seen in the ECG, would have remained con constant. Similarly, the PR prolongs and RR shortens. Because we don't have a PR, that also we cannot see. So what we can see is short equivalent of shortening of RR, which in this case is shortening of PP. So we have a progressive shortening of PP interval, which culminates in a pause. And this pause is usually less than twice that of last PP interval, just like a AV not going back. So we not get, need not get confused. What we see is group beating and within the group beating, we see progressive shortening of PP interval and no blocked P, no blocked QRS. If that is the scenario, probably we are dealing with SA node Venky back phenomenon. As in this ECG, we can see there are group beating of three sinus beats each. And within the group, the first PP interval is longer than the second PP interval. Subsequent P got blocked, but we don't have any direct evidence of that in the ECG. And that resulted in a pause and the sequence repeats. So this is a four is to three SA node, Mobitz type one exit block. I know it's a bit confusing just because we are not very familiar to it. Let's take a short break here. So this is the Mark Twain quote, don't let schooling interfere with your education. So we have to systematically approach and we need not try to fit what we have written in the books into the ECG. Rather we have to go by the ECG and see what it is uh, showing us. Next comes the SA node exit block, Mobitz type two. This is very uh, easy to remember because we have pauses, we have sinus rhythm going on, in between we have pauses, and those pauses are exactly a multiple of the basic PP interval. So here we have a pause, this is around seven big squares, and the PP interval is around three and a half big squares. So this is a two is intermittently happening, two is to one, uh, SA node exit block, Mobitz type two. So differentiating between a sinus pause and a sinus exit block, just see whether the pause is a multiple of basic PP interval. So the basic PP interval will be constant in Mobitz type two block, and the pause will be multiple of that PP interval. Whereas a random pause will not be a multiple of the basic PP interval. So this one is easier to identify. Now coming to the more common scenario of sinus node dysfunction, we clinically encounter, it's just a sinus pause. A pause means a random absence of a P wave. And either the sinus itself or a subsequently lower focus, atrium or more commonly junction, or even a ventricle escapes to terminate the pause. And this pause will not be a multiple of any PP interval. So that defined a sinus pause. Why this has happened, we cannot find out from the ECG. It may be just that sinus node didn't produce any impulse or impulse was there, but it got totally blocked, like third degree SA block. So we don't uh, have any means to differentiate between these two. But sinus arrest means technically, sinus node is not producing any impulse. Whereas a sinus pause is the result, consequence of that sinus arrest. And it, commonly this happens in setting with the atrial fibrillation, paroxysmal atrial fibrillation, and the, together they are called sick sinus syndrome, tachybrady syndrome, and so on. Another very interesting pause is termination related pause. Actually, we have to train our eyes to pick it up because patients come with syncope and basal ECG will show atrial fibrillation or atrial flutter. And when you do a halter, you will see that there is a pause that is responsible for syncope. But the pause is probably not because of sinus node disease itself. It is because chronic overdrive suppression of the sinus node. Long time uh, atrial tachycardia or flutter was going on and that was keeping on bombarding on the SA node, suppressing it. And suddenly the flutter terminates, SA node takes a while to wake up. And that results in a pause. This treatment wise is very important because many of these patients respond to atrial flutter ablation alone without a pacemaker. But natural history suggests that many of these patients also have some mild sort of sinus node dysfunction and eventually they may need pacemaker during follow-up. So unless we treat the tachycardia first, we'll end up putting a pacemaker prematurely in such patients. So this is a termination related pause and we have to especially look for it in patients with documented tachycardia, atrial arrhythmia coming with syncope. Another quote for us, right word may be effective, but no word was ever as effective as a rightly timed pause, talking about pauses. Now we'll move on to the junctional rhythm. Here is an ECG which shows junctional rhythm with VA conduction. 
there's no preceding p wave in uh, this ecg for any qrs but subsequent to qrs we have a p wave most importantly this p wave is inverted 2 3 avf shows negative p wave that means it's a retrograde p probably the junction has taken over and it is faster than the sinus node and it is taken over and not only that it is causing retrograde p wave apart from that there is an incomplete right bundle branch block so this is a junctional rhythm with va conduction when this happened at low rate we call it an escape rhythm when it happens at a normal sinus rate like 70 or 80 and you can see p wave is dissociated then you cause it call it accelerated junctional rhythm causing isorhythmic av dissociation but in this case there is no av dissociation because one to one p to qrs relationship is there i'll be p follows the qrs that is junction drives the atm initially told about pauses escape beats ectopic beats and all and this is a very classical bradyarrhythmia arrhythmia called escape capture by gemini as you note here especially best seen in maybe v1 none of the qrs within the group the first beat doesn't have any p wave throughout the ecg so that's a escape beat it terminates a pause it comes after a pause so it's a escape beat other one actually comes prematurely but if you see closely especially v1 v2 and all you can see a p wave preceding it so what has happened was sinus was slow so junction escaped but as soon as the junction escaped sinus also fired and this firing fell outside the t wave so it managed to capture the ventricle again so this second one is now called a capture beat not an ectopic beat because it didn't happen in sinus rhythm you know? it happened after an escape beat so it's called a capture beat and the sequence is called escape capture by gemini there are four or five forms of by gemini and this one is relatively rare the commonest is block by gemini when you have a 3 to 2 block you get a by gemini next common is ectopic by gemini where you will get ectopy in by gemini form then comes this escape capture by gemini even rare is the echo by gemini they are not showed here and it's important to identify this escape beats as well as capture beats because the terminology though subtly different you have to understand now going to the atrial level atrial standstill which i have already discussed any ecg like this like we saw a junctional rhythm just one ecg prior this also is a junctional rhythm but in this case there is no p wave whatsoever neither following nor preceding the qrs complexes so in this case we have to suspect atrial standstill also there are other clues like fragmented qrs we want to v4 uh, or even v5 qrs having a bizarre notch it doesn't qualify as rbb neither it uh, falls into lbbb so it's some myocardial pathology is happening there are two excitation fronts fusing that's why you are getting a notch in the qrs usually such and repolarization abnormalities too like t wave inversions throughout v1 to v5 usually it correlates with a restrictive heart disease or infiltrative cardiomyopathy and atrial infiltration causes lack of excitable tissue in the atrium and you will get atrial standstill very commonly seen in amyloidosis restrictive idiopathic restrictive cardiomyopathy and progressive sick sinus syndrome fibrosing types and so on if you do an echo we will not see any uh, mitral or tricuspid a wave filling only e wave will be there and uh, san conan is actually put a ep catheter excite the atrium at full output paste the atrium at full output and it will not capture you paste from multiple sides and you will not capture then you call it atrial standstill this carries a very high risk of thromboembolism because stagnation in atrium predisposes to clot formation actually the stroke risk is much higher than that of atrial fibrillation this patient uh, had a restrictive cardiomyopathy and ep proven atrial standstill subsequently uh, he was put on anticoagulation now going to the av node this is the classical first degree av block uh, nobody will miss this but interestingly it's a very long pr interval the pr is actually more than 200 milliseconds i think much to discuss in this ecg but some clues that block is at the level of av node comes from one old paper which says that any pr more than 300 milliseconds the odds of localizing pain in the av node is 38 most almost always it will be in the av node so very long pr interval the pathological thing is in the av node usually such patient have very low risk of sudden death but because atrial contraction may happen against closed av wards may have fatty and low cardiac output related symptoms sometimes needing a pacemaker otherwise first degree av block is not generally a indication for pacemaker but very long pr interval where av synchrony is affected and that causes symptoms may sometimes need a is maker to reduce the pr to reduce the av delay it's best seen in the echo as ea delay t wave and a wave you will see that the av falls on a closed tricuspid wall canon is also may happen 
coming to Mobit Strike for Navy Block, the classical Winkyback, which we all are very familiar. Again, Winkyback almost always localizes the pathology at AV node, though there are very rare uh, examples reported where Winkyback happening in the infra end issue. Practically, all cases of Winkyback, the pathology lies in the AV node. And usually the QRS complex will be narrow unless you have coexisting infra end disease as well. Here you can see that it's a long cycle Winkyback. The eyeballing itself may miss the increment in PR interval. It's so subtle. And after a long sequence, suddenly one P wave has brought, blocked. And in such a sequence, better seen in halter than ECG, look for the subsequent P wave. Subsequent PR interval clearly has shortened. We may not be able to appreciate the progressive stretching of this PR interval because the stretch is subtle, happens over only very few milliseconds with every cardiac cycle. But post drop, the PR interval has shortened. This is a clue that it is a Venky band. And the mathematics of it defines it as the pause should be less than twice the last RR interval. Last RR interval is usually the shortest and uh, the pause should be less than twice of it. This is a case of Movich type 2 AV block. It's not very common to see. And in this particular patient, the ratio is 3 to 1. When you have 2 to 1, it's classified as a separate entity. But anything more than that, you call it a high-grade AV block as well as Movich type 2 block. Here, the um, block is... Pattern is mathematical. Every third P wave gets conducted. So it's also a high grade AV block because by definition, high grade AV block requires two consecutive P waves to get blocked. That's happening. So it's also a high grade AV block. But because there is a pattern, you can classify it as three stone AV block, which falls under the perspex of Mobit type two AV block. I just want to highlight that uh, confusing terminology, high grade AV block. Any two consecutively blocked P waves emits some conduction. Not all P waves are blocked but more than one are uh, sequentially blocked, then you call it high-grade AV block. Many of those high-grade AV block also will fall into the Mobitz type 2 definition. So it's just semantic. Apart from this, you have a 2 is to 1 AV block. 2 is to 1 AV block, strictly speaking, cannot be classified as Mobitz type 1 or type 2. It's a different entity. You can attempt to localize it as proximal conduction system or distal conduction system. If you have a narrow QRS, normal PR interval, chances are more than that. For even high long PR interval, hence are more that block is supra in or within the AV node. Whereas wide QRS usually suggests infra ICN disease, like in this case. QRS is not only wide, it's having an atypical RBB like a um, morphology. So every alternate P wave is getting blocked. Now coming to CHB, I'll elaborate the CHB definition here once more. So it requires three limbs or four limbs. First limb is constant atrial rate. PP interval should be constant. Second rate is, second thing is RR interval is also constant. Ventricular rate is also constant. However, there is no relation between P and QRS. So the PR interval, the term itself is a misnomer. But if you want to use it, the PR interval varies from B to B. There's no constant PR interval at all because there's no Recording stopped. P and QRS. And last but not the least, atrial rate should be higher than the ventricular rate. All of these rules may have exceptions. We have, all of us have seen CHP with irregular heart rate. We have some uh, subset of causes for that. But in general, CHB will have a regular ventricular rate, depending on escape rhythm, whether it's proximal or distal. Supraisian or infraisian, it will be either narrow or wide. In this case, it is narrow. And atrial rate will be more than the ventricular rate. If ventricular rate is more than atrial rate, then you call it ventricular tachycardia. So AV dissociation is of three forms. One is CHB, where atrial rate is more than ventricular rate. Second is ventricular tachycardia, where ventricular rate is more than atrial rate. And isorhythmic AV dissociation, where both atrium and ventricle are at near similar rates, but they don't have relation with each other. The PR is varying. So there are three types of AV dissociation. CHB is one of them. And there are some high risk features which we have to look when we have a CHB. One is high atrial rate for the age. High atrial rate indicates that there is a high sympathetic tone. The body is trying to maintain the cardiac output by increasing the sympathetic tone. But because of the CHB, it's not happening. Such patients are prone to develop pulmonary edema, uh, sudden cardiac death without. Then wide QRS escape, it indicates infra ischian escape. It's not predictable. It may just die out suddenly. Unstable escape, there's no single constant morphology. We to be variation in morphology is happening. Repolarization changes, especially T wave, T deep T wave inversions, QT prolongations, complex PVCs, all of them. Recording in progress. Probably there is a likelihood of developing a torsades and clinically syncope. All these are high risk features in a given case of CHP. The symptomatic narrow QRS CHB, atrial rate is fine, QT interval is fine. Usually, uh, you can do an elective pacemaker. But as I 
symptomatic CHB or wide QRS CHB or uh, QTT changes have happened, better to do a pacemaker without waiting. That's the nutshell of it. And this is an uh, example for a wide QRS escape happening in a complete heart block. Also note the high atrial rate. This is an adult patient. You can see the atrial rate is more than 100. Probably there is increased sympathetic drive and one P wave managed to conduct. Probably conduct. We don't know because it may be just facetious relation. Unless it's reproducible, we cannot be sure that it got conducted. But when it got conducted, there's a right bundle branch block morphology suggesting that it's an infra ischian disease. We already discussed what is a high-grade AV block. This is a more classical example where there is no definite pattern. Randomly, two or more consecutive PUs are getting blocked. And again, wide QRS indicates infra ischian disease. Another interesting AV block. So we have now discussed many forms of AV block. First degree, second degree, complete AV block, two to one AV block. Within the second degree, mobile type one, type two. Now there are two more AV blocks, which usually we don't discuss. One is a paroxysmal AV block. It's defined as abrupt and unexpected change from one to one AV condition. Recording stopped. For no apparent reason, this, this is an ILR tracing of a patient with infrequent uh, syncope. So this patient was having sinus rhythm. Everything was normal. Atal rate, ventricular rate, everything was normal. Suddenly, for no apparent reason, there is a complete heart block. Only PUS are seen without any QRS. And that lasted for a few seconds before an escape rhythm came. And subsequently, uh, sinus took over. One to one Recording in progress. And this happened for apparently no reason. That's the most important thing. So it's called paroxysmal AV block. It's not a CHB because it's a, it's a long strip of blocked P waves with nothing in between. And this is another interesting ECG, which we published in European Journal of Internal Medicine a few years back. This is also a paroxysmal AV block, but it's called a phase four AV block. There are many theories uh, argue that this should not be used. This terminology phase four should not be used, but we'll not go into that. What happens here is a single ectopic triggers a long AV block. So this patient was having sinusism, probably with right bundle branch block or some form of aberrant conduction. Suddenly, an ectopic has come, and post-ectopic, you have three PUS blocked. And in this patient's halter, this was happening throughout the day, and some of the episodes were long and causing syncope. So ectopy followed by paroxysmal AV block. So what is thought is that the sodium channels are diseased and locked in a partial state of depolarization so when you, uh, because of this ectopy. So that causes subsequent PUS to block. Unless this block is recovered, either by a cardiac thumb or a small, another ectopy, or spontaneous recovery, all the PUS continue to get blocked. Then suddenly it recovers, only to get blocked again by a small cycling change, usually triggered by ectopy, but also can be due to sinus arrhythmia. So phase four AV block is ectopy triggered proximal AV block. Coming to last but not the least form of AV block, this is perhaps the most common one, vagotonic AV block. This also mimics a proximal AV block. It's usually benign, seen in normal, healthy individuals during sleep. Here, the clue that it is vagotonic and not paroxysmal is that the PP interval lengthens before the block. Because it's a vagotonic AV block, it also slows down the AV node. And AV node also slows, sinus node, sorry, it also slows down the sinus node. The PP interval prolongs, PR interval prolongs, you may end up in Venky back, and then you get a CHB and a pause ensues, and subsequently it recovers. So it can sometimes be pathological, but almost always it's a benign entity, especially when it's asymptomatic. Note that the atal rate slows down in contrast to the paroxysmal AV block, where atal rate tends to be faster and faster. As the block progresses, cardiac output falls, sympathetic tone take takes over, and the PP interval shortens. You can see that this PP longer here and tends to shorten as the block proceeds. Whereas in a vagotonic AV block, everything is calm and quiet. PP slows down. Even during the block, there's no signs of distress. Now, going beyond bradyarrhythmias, so sometimes you may have tachyarrhythmias in combination with bradyarrhythmias, or you may have clues to underlying structural heart disease, or sometimes you may see effects of drug or uh, metabolic abnormalities in the ECG. And that may be the causing the bradyarrhythmias. So last four or five ECGs will be focusing on that. This is a case of congenital AV block. For years, he was under follow without a pacemaker because he was asymptomatic. And during last visit, he has come with no P waves. Instead of that, there are fibrillation waves. And QRS is slow, but regular. So it's a 31-year asymptomatic man. There's a natural history of congenital uh, heart block if left untreated. Atria will dilate. 
and finally end up in atrial fibrillation. So we have to treat them. There's no hurry to treat them, agreed. But at one point, we have to take the decision that we have to put a pacemaker. Whenever you have a cardiac chamber dilation, like atrial or ventricular enlargement, better to go for a uh, pacemaker, even if it's a congenital AV block, low risk for sudden death, and asymptomatic. Because otherwise, the natural history will be uh, replaced by heart failure and atrial fibrillation, increased stroke risk and sudden death. And always look for digitalis effect in such ECG. Whenever you have an AF with complete heart block, always look for digitalis effect. This is another interesting ECG where there is atrial flutter coupled with complete heart block. The clue here is that one, of course, ventricular rate is regular, but you can have a regular ventricular rate when you have a fixed AV conduction instead of varying AV conduction in atrial flutter. But my arrows point towards the, I don't know whether we can call it PR interval, it's actually FR interval, flutter to QRS coupling interval. That keeps on varying. There's no constant flutter to QRS relation. Constant FF interval, that PP interval is constant, RR interval is constant, but PR interval is varying, FR interval is varying, and atrial rate is more than ventricular rate. So everything put together, it's an atrial flutter with complete heart block. So this should not be passed on as just an atrial flutter, cut it and leave it. This should be uh, treated with pacemaker because it's a complete heart block. So this is another interesting example. This is not very uncommon. Many of these complete heart block patients who come with syncope actually have this problem, not because of bradyhypnia, they faint, but because of polymorphic VT. This is a classical ECG where the bradycardia has caused a QT prolongation, deep asymmetrical T wave inversions with QT prolongation. And it's a very nice substrate for developing a torsades. Another very useful tip here is that when you put a temporary pacemaker, ensure that it constantly captures with a good threshold and stable position. If it gets displaced, what will happen is it will deliver a spike and it may not capture or it, sometimes it may capture. But this inconsistent capture causes a long short sequence. When you have a captured bit, your RR is shorter. Then if you don't have a uh, captured bit, your RR is longer. The long short sequence is classical trigger for a torsades. So we may end up doing harm by putting a temporary pacemaker. Uh, if we are not ensuring a constant pacing rate, we usually keep at a higher rate, 80 to 90, to bring down the QT interval. It's very common in uh, elderly females with chronic complete heart block rather than an acute complete heart block. And we have to, again, be very cautious to pick it up. Here's another interesting complete heart block. Obviously, it's a complete heart block. Atrial rate is more than ventricular rate. Atrial rate is regular. Ventricular rate is regular. PR is varying. So it meets, meets all the definitions. And there's also LVH, but not the T wave. This T wave actually throw a very strong hunch, hunch of, of course, hyperkalemia, very rapid rise of T wave that is almost like an acute angle and narrow base T wave. So this lady actually had atrial stenosis as well as hyperkalemia with a potassium of seven. She was in a nephrology ward with CKD when she developed this arrhythmia and subsequent to dialysis when her potassium was normalized. Both are complete heart block as well as her ECG. Now we can note the C ECG, the T waves, how different they are. Even the ST is showing some depression in the form of strain. So this is a reversible, uh, means of course there will be some infrasion disease, but the acute trigger was hyperkalemia. And this hyperkalemia could act actually prospectively be diagnosed using this ECG, even before the potassium tape, because of this uh, T wave morphology in V5 to V4 and V5. So I think I'm towards the end of my, uh, I one or two ECGs may be there. This is another interesting type 1 AV block, Mobitz type 1 AV block. It's actually Venky band, 2 is to 1 and 3 is to 2 alternating. But the very important clue here is there is no septal Q waves. If you see the QRS closely, there is no Q waves at all. And that suggests a ventricular inversion. Coupled with this deep Q waves in lead 3, narrow base deep Q waves in lead 3, one should suspect a corrected transposition. When you don't have a septal Q wave, Always think of ventricular inversion, commonest cause of which is corrected transposition. And corrected transposition is well known to be associated with AV conduction blocks. So this patient actually had a corrected transposition. He was asymptomatic and a 21-year-old man. But the ECG itself gives the clue uh, for the trained eyes. And this is another fascinating case. Very unfortunate for the patient though. This is a 2 to 1 AV block. All of us know that for every two P waves, only one is getting connected. But what is the cause of the block? Is it really a block? If you see closely enough, especially in lead one, the PV is blocked because it falls on the ST segment. 
unless the sc segment is over and the p wave is at least half recording starts recording in progress needs to accept the p wave the p wave gets blocked because of pathological refractiveness of the ventricle why the pathological refractiveness just because the qt is so long if you see here the qt interval is so long probably long qt 3 type st segment is so long and stretched that the qt interval is so prolonged the p wave encounters a non deep repolarized ventricle the ventricle is still depolarized when the p wave comes so it gets blocked so there's no pathological av block itself it's due to pathological refractiveness of the ventricle that the p wave is getting blocked and these patients usually are long qt 3 when you encounter them in neonatal period that's the commonest cause of uh, long qt syndrome related av block in neonates long qt 3 syndrome and they have extremely bad prognosis you have to identify this as not a congenital two stone av block or chgb but as long qt 3 syndrome itself because the prognosis is so bad and this particular kid itself didn't make it beyond 2 months and another exotic type of uh, bradyarrhythmia so called alternating bundelmann's block this is defined as rbbb and lbbb seen in the same patient either in the same same ecg or at different times it indicates advanced infra ecg disease both the bundelmann's are disease at times you get rbbb at times you get lbbb like in this halter tracing that is a v1 equivalent channel is showing rbbb initially it's showing rbbb top panel whereas the bottom panel the same patient showing lbbb so these patients are just waiting to develop a syncope and cardiac arrest because hu interval will be so long unless you do ap study you will not realize the severity we will think that it's one to one av conduction only some bundle match block but unless we see this both tracings together or we be as well as lb happening in the same patient or if he has a syncope we will just pass it off as likely bundle match block so this is an alternative bundle match block not very common probably not very commonly recognized as well and there's no clear guideline based on data but all guidelines say when you see this put a pacemaker and finally this is an asymptomatic 38 year old man apparently there is sinus bradycardia first degree av block and ivcd everything is wrong pp interval wrong p interval is wrong your duration is also wrong so naturally we may think it's a pan conduction disease but always verify the paper speed and ensure that it's a normal speed ecg in this particular case there's a 50 mm speed accidentally taken ecg mimicked bradycardia or bradyarrhythmia whereas actually patient didn't have any problem at all that also becomes part of our analysis of ecg so to look for paper speed before diagnosing that your bradyarrhythmia that's thing uh, paper speed so finally one more quote all generalizations are false including this one again from mark twain thank you all uh, thank you mohan for that excellent presentation very interesting ecgs and very interesting quotations thank you thank you particularly the one the school should not interfere with your education yes sir <laughs> very good i think there's one question in the chat box uh, dr anuradha wants to know please explain about isorhythmic av dissociation okay fine so uh, i didn't uh, include an example because i didn't regard it as a part of bradycardia so isorhythmic av dissociation isorhythmic means there are two foci with near constant rate and they are firing near simultaneously usually it happens because of accelerated junctional rhythm so the sinus is not very fast it towards lower end of normal like 60 or 70 whereas junction is usual upper limit is 40 to 50 thus decided to accelerate to 60 or 70 so you will get a ecg where the atrium is under the influence of sinus node you will get a p wave axis that defines a sinus node and ventricle it's uh, decided by the qrs sorry qrs is decided by the junction so you still get a uh, junctional rhythm that controls the ventricle and sinus rhythm controlling the atrium because the rates are so similar in short st strips of ecg you may have the no near con constant pr interval but if you take longer ecgs you will see that p tends to walk into qrs and walks beyond the qrs and pr interval keeps on changing you know in, in a narrow zone because they are near same rates like 60 and 70 sinus as well as junction then you call it isorhythmic av dissociation uh, uh, and the one is the differences between sa exit block and av block in ecg okay to simply uh, state it in one sentence p to qrs relationship will be preserved in sa exit block whereas p to qrs relation will be disturbed in av block rest of it we have to analyze what's the pp interval how it behaves what's the pr interval 
like that, which we have explained during our two example illustrations. But when you have one-to-one -one QRS relationship and irregular rhythm, there's no AV block. Whereas any perturbation of one-to-one uh, one -one QRS relationship means that there is AV block. It's the most simple form of, form of it, I think. Uh, no more questions. Uh, Dr. Mukunda, this congenital complete heart block, you know, sure. with a narrow QRS, when do you take a decision to pace them? Uh, yes, sir. the guideline says that there is always the indication of pacing. It's the question, only the question of when. Yeah, when. So in practice, what we do is, one, if you have a structural heart disease versus no structural heart disease. If you have a structural heart disease, better to start pacing. Just a minute, sir, I will to plug, plug my... Sure, sure. Uh, when you have a structural heart disease, you I will lower uh, cut off. Uh, older guidelines used to say 55 per minute. Now there are some guidelines saying 75 per minute. If the ventricular rate is less than that, go for a pacemaker. Whereas if there is no structural heart disease, you can wait if heart rate is more than 50 and no symptoms. And what we do in practice is if uh, growth is happening normally, there's no heart failure, ECG is not showing any repolarization abnormalities, complex ectopy, atrial rate is not inappropriately you know, high for the kid. We just closely follow up and do echoes every six months to 12 months and see whether there's a cardiac dilation or mitral regurgitation happening. If that's happening, we'll go for pacemaker. If not, we'll wait for the growth to complete because younger age, if you put the lead, uh, the, as the uh, kid grows, loop may come down. Similarly, longevity of the lead is also lesser in younger age. So we'll wait till eight, nine years at least and then put a dual chamber pacemaker. At least 15 kilogram is needed for it. Uh, people do it 10 kilogram also, but most people are comfortable if weight is 15 kilogram before they put an endocardial pacemaker. Before that, we'll have to go for an epicardial. There's one question. Uh, they want you to request, requesting you to repeat AF with complete heart block. Uh, you mean atrial fibrillation or flutter? AF, AF atrial fibrillation. Okay, atrial fibrillation with complete heart block. We have to suspect in an AF patient when you have a regular heart rate. Sometimes very slow uh, ventricular rate may mimic apparently regular. So we are always to measure with caliper. Eyeballing may not help when the heart rate is very fast or very slow. And we have mathematically regular heart rate in the space of an atrial fibrillation. That's enough for diagnosing AF with complete heart block. Always look for digitalis effect because many of the patients receive digoxin and digoxin toxicity can cause CHP. So when you have such an ECG where you suspect AF with complete heart block, Always look actively for uh, digoxin toxicity because that can be lethal otherwise. Uh, Dr. Manjunath, is that the question you asked? Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, Dr. Uh, can I ask yeah. one question, Mukun, uh, okay. regarding atrial standstill and how to differentiate? Uh, your audio okay. is not clear. So can, you can, you repeat it? can you repeat the question, Dr. Yeah. Uh, in the yeah. atrial standstill and the junctional That's a very rhythm. nice question, sir. Uh, usually, junctional rhythm either should have a retrograde atrial conduction, negative P wave after the QRS, or it should have a uh, atrial or sinus P waves, which are very slow, slower than the QRS rate. So, if is, it, is it always a must? Uh, is it always a must uh, yes. in junctional rhythm? In a single ECG, it's not a must, sir. But if you are doing a halter or a repeated ECG or a period of time, yeah. at some point, you should be able to see some P wave, either antigrade or retrograde. If not, you should suspect it will stand still. Yeah, but yeah. the confirmatory thing is only when you put a catheter and place at maximum output and you are not able to capture the uh, atrium. Then only you can confirm it. But your index of suspicion should be high. This is very important in pacemaker clinic where you put six mm -hmm. sinus syndrome pacemakers, single chamber pacemakers, and they will come for follow-up for years. And over a period of time, you will see that uh, PUS have lost. So it's a progressive sinus node dysfunction, six sinus syndrome, where atrial sensor has happened. And if you don't realize, he may come back with a stroke later. Oh, thank you. Thanks. And a lot too, of yeah. interesting ECGs you have shown. <laughs> thank you. Good thing to learn. Thank yeah. you. I think thank you made you. a very important point about the atrial standstill because there's the same thing we call, call it also stunned, stunned atrium, right? Coat triatriatum uh, is also one of the causes of atrial sensor. Yeah, stunned atrium. Stunned atrium, yeah. yeah. Atrial because, paralysis, stunned atrium, yeah. atrial sensing, yeah. so many terminologies are there. Yeah, there's one condition where, you know, without AF, you give the patient anticoagulation anti to Correct. prevent strokes. Very important cause. Yes. Sir. The last question I have is, uh, you know, first degree AV block, sure. when you exercise, what happens to it? 
usually if it is a vagotonic thing uh, it should improve and okay. if it is what they say is suprasian versus infrasian if it is suprasian uh, exercise induced sympathetic drive tends to improve the avf conduction shorten the pr interval whereas if it is infrasian what happens is you get better conduction of av node and you mo- get more the faster impulses bombarded on the infrasian conduction system and block tends to get worse okay so it uh, usually uh, mild pr prolongation can be intra or infrasian in such cases exercise may worsen but a very long pr interval usually is av nodal and exercise tends to improve the same applies to isoprenal nas okay thank you any other thank questions you. from any other uh, delegates or any comments from any other faculty members okay uh thank you mukund for very uh, really nice good this is very good uh, thank you thank you we enjoyed it we learned a lot yeah. thank you very much thank you sir thank, you. thank uh, all the delegates i thank uh, our manipal uh, it group of who is there afis afis is there afis afis sir, thank, you. Abu, thank, you. Sir, thank you abu thank you ah thank you mr malakaju thanks out thank you sir. Thank okay, you sir. and Thank good you. night everyone. Good night. Thank you. Thank you sir. Yeah. Thank you. Record